Good morning. How are you all? Hope your bellies are full. Had a lot of good breakfast food this morning. We just have very few announcements, so praise team, if you guys want to go ahead and come on up. We don't have many at all today. Okay, first announcements. Uh, Super Bowl Sunday, February 12th, 6 p.m. John and Brianne are going to have a Super Bowl party at their house. They asked that uh, everyone is welcome. Just bring some finger foods to help to help feed everybody that's coming. Uh, so February 12, 6 p.m. The theme for February, th the theme Sunday for February is wear a shade of red on February 19th. So February 19th, wear red or a shade of red. Um, the church Valentine's dinner has been canceled. Uh, we did not have enough people to sign up for that, so we have canceled that. Also, um, we rescheduled the church work day for some time in the spring. We'll let you know when we decide about that. It was supposed to be yesterday, but we just thought... It was a beautiful day yesterday, but with the weather being unknown, we just thought we'll just wait till a closer time to spring. And then Matt and Cherish will be there to help us and the girls, so we'll put y'all to work. Especially Evie, absolutely. Okay, and the last thing is, this was just kind of popped out of thin air yesterday. March 25th, ladies, we are going to go on a trip to the hot springs of North Carolina. Uh, We'll talk about it, maybe. Um, so on March 25th, we're going to the Hot Springs in North Carolina just to have a day together uh, to hang out at the Hot Springs um, over there. So if you wanted to go, let me know, and I'll put your name down, and I, that way I can call and get how much it is and all that kind of stuff. So let me know if you want to come, and we'll take the church van, and we'll just have us a good old time, probably leave, have lunch, go to the place, and then have dinner, and then come home. So we won't be spending uh, the night, but we will be spending most of the day. All right. Um, that's all. Oh, offering. I always forget about the offering this time. <laughs> uh, Gary's going to be passing around the bucket for the offering. Um, if you want to place your offering in there. Or you can give online, whichever is best for you. Let's pray over the offering. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for this place that we have to worship. I want to thank you for the people that are here. Lord, I thank you for the week that you've brought us through and the beautiful day that we had yesterday. Lord, I pray that you blessings on this service, Lord, and accept our giving as our worship to you. As we go into this time of worship in our service, Lord, bless the musicians, bless their voices, bless their hands. Lord, we know that... It, we are giving this all to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Everybody morning. wants to stand. We're going to start to worship the Lord. Sorry. Hey, we've got really good cooks in this church, don't we? Everybody get full? Is it time to go home and take a nap now? <laughs> all right. Thank you for everybody that brought something. It was all delicious. And now we're going to maybe dance and jump and burn some calories. Sorry, I can't. But we're going to we're going to put forth an effort anyway. Okay. All right, guys. Glory. 
burn some calories this morning just for a second? <laughs> All right.
majesty let all the earth rejoice let all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at
somebody's body whether it's bringing salvation to a, an individual or an entire family it just you know there's some days when you stand up here and you just want to say nothing sometimes I know I can't but <laughs> there's just some days that you want to raise your hands in the air and you want to praise God for no other reason than just to praise Him. Not because you need something or you want something, just because He is so, so good. Whew. I'm just moved to tears this morning by God's presence, and I know He wants to move in this service, and I know He wants to change lives, And but you know, I'm thankful, I'm grateful that He changed mine. I'm thankful that I'm not the same as I used to be. Can y'all say that? Just want to give God the glory this morning. We're going to do things uh, just a little bit different this morning. We've got one more song that, that's going to be sung this morning. It's kind of a special. And uh, Jamie back here is going to play. And then I'm going to do communion and the prayer requests and dismiss the kids. And we're going to move on with service. But God's chasing after you this morning. He's going to speak to you if you'll open your mind and open your heart to him. So Jamie, if you want to come on up and we'll, we'll do that song and we'll move on with the rest of service. beautiful up there and I was thinking about how a lighthouse never moves and that's the way God has always been in my life he's never moved he's always been there for me but I have moved many times and I've moved in the opposite direction and I heard this song at work the other day I've never sang this song before and uh, I saw it come up on my Pandora and I looked down and the name of the song is called Chasing Rebels and I thought oh it's a wild song I don't think <laughs> And it is, but in a good way. And it talks about how he comes chasing after us. He comes to us in our situations. And he knows how to take nothing and make something. And that's the only reason why I'm standing here today. I sang you this song. And I want you to listen closely to these words. I'm not a big speaker. I just sang at my little country church. But uh, if I could tell you my testimony this morning, it would be the words to this song. So all I want to do is sing it for you, and I hope it touches you. I just want you to remember this morning, no matter what, you're never too far gone. Never too far out there. That lighthouse is still, still there where it was. And God loves you so much this morning. And I just thank God for everything he's done for me.
coming for you. He's coming for you. Y'all can go ahead and pass out communion. Just give him a hand this morning. Let's just praise God. Aren't you glad he's coming for you? Chasing rebels down just like me.
Where did he meet you at? Where did he chase you down at? He chased me down in a holler over in Saltville, outside the dope man's house. As we get ready to take communion this morning, I want you to remember what he's done for you. He said, do this in remembrance of him. But that's also what he did for you. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures this morning. Acts 20 verse 7 says, On the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept talking till midnight. Y'all want us to keep talking till midnight today? Y'all want to have some church today? But my point there was, they come together to break bread. They come together to recognize what Jesus had done. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. John 6, 33. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. John 6, 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I'm going to read that again. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. How many of y'all are hungry? How many of y'all has the world just been beaten up? How many of y'all have walked through a hard time that sometimes you didn't know exactly how you were going to make it through? Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You will find your answers at the cross. And Luke 22, 19 and 20. He took, and he took bread. Let's raise our bread up in the air this morning if everybody's got it. Jesus, he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Lord, I thank you for your word that says your body was beaten for us and the wounds that you received was for our healing. Lord, we know that there's things in the church that people are praying for, and healing is one of them. Salvation, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to touch their hearts. Touch their bodies. Mend what needs to be mended. Put back together, Lord, their hearts. And he said, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Lord, most of all, I thank you for your blood. Lord, the life is in the blood. Lord, we thank you. Lord, as we drink this morning and remember you, Lord, that you make a way for our life today. Let's drink. Wow.
What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Can you give Jesus a big hand clap of praise this morning? Amen. Amen. I'm so glad to be home today. Amen. Amen. Uh, that scripture came to mind this morning. I was so glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. I just want to greet you. I'm not preaching today. Our sabbatical is not over. Um, we're still going through the month of February and got some places we're going to be traveling to over the next two or three weeks. But I just wanted to be here today. We wanted to be here today with you all. Finish the fast with you today. Uh, what a wonderful breakfast. Thank you all for those that cook so much good food. Would you give everybody a, a big hand that cooked today? I'm really glad I'm not preaching today because by the time Kevin gets up here, uh, y'all going to be fighting taking a nap after that good meal. So um, you may need to pinch somebody next to you if you see them nodding today. Just keep them awake. Um, but um, I, I just want to say how good it is to be here. I am so proud of you all. Um, I've watched the service every week over the last three Sundays we've been gone. And y'all done phenomenal. And what a tremendous... What a tremendous church we have. Amen? Amen? We really do. You know, a few years back, I would have felt, you know, threatened by the fact that y'all could do good without me. But, you know, like, like, oh, no, they don't need me anymore. But now I'm at the office of well, like, hey, they don't need me anymore. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I know you still like me and want me to be here. But y'all are doing phenomenal. And so grateful for that. I, I just want to share one little scripture. And, Jamie, your song just wrecked me this morning. It just absolutely wrecked me. I'm so glad. I almost wanted to get up and say something right after it. I'm glad I didn't because I would have bawled. Um, and I, I, I've been over these last month and really just been the last week, just to be honest with you, that I feel like I'm starting to kind of get some clarity. It's taken that long. Uh, we just, just about a week ago. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to read again. I've read two books in the last two days, finished another one earlier in the week. So all of a sudden, I'm reading again. And I haven't done that for a long time. And, and I'm feeling such a desire to pray. Not that I haven't always wanted to, but it's like now it's like I really want to. And I just, I can sense this pause is doing so much good in my life, and I believe it is in our family's life as well. And I've been studying the life of Jacob. I may preach on that starting in March. Um, but I, I've been meditating on this scripture, and your song just reveals something to me that I needed today. And in Genesis chapter 28, verse 10, it says, Now Jacob went out from Beersheba, went to Haran. Now, the story of Jacob, you don't know it, he had deceived his father, stolen the birthright from his brother, stolen the blessing of the firstborn, and now he was running for his life. He had messed up. The life of Jacob was a real screw-up, just all the way through. And he messed up again. He was running for his life. He had not done things right. He had not behaved properly. It says, verse 11, he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it in his head. He lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on earth, and the top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were descending and ascending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, he spoke this to a man running for his life that had behaved badly. Out of the blue, in the middle of a desert, he said this. I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. 
Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east and north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the family of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. As you sang that song this morning, Jamie, I just, it just connected with this scripture. I realized I have tried so hard all my life to do the right thing. Not that that's a bad thing to do. But I've tried so hard all my life to be everything I thought God wanted me to be. And here is Jacob, who is messed up in every way. And he's getting this incredible promise out of the blue. And I'm like, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how God operates. He doesn't visit us because we've been good and tried hard and been better than everybody else. He visits us because he just makes up his mind he wants you. And then it goes on. And I got, I'm not preaching today, so I've got to be quick. Verse 16, that Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone that he had put on his head, set it up as a pillar, poured oil on top of it, and called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. The name Bethel means house of God. That desert place, that rocky place where he was running in and, 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 and total um, despair became the house of God. Not because of his efforts, not because he'd been better than everybody else, but because God just chose to chase him. A rebel running. I think back in my life how many times God has done that for me. And that is where I'm at right now. And as we continue through this sabbatical, I'm so grateful you all have given us this opportunity to pause. We're still involved. We're still around. Kevin has done an amazing job leading this church and in staying in contact with me. And I'm so grateful for him. So we're not out of the loop. I want you to know that. I told you I wasn't quitting. We're just taking a pause. But during this pause... I'm asking God for my Bethel. I don't, need, I don't deserve it. It's not because I've been good. It's because I just need him to show up in my life. And I'm just waiting for my Bethel. Amen? How many could use a Bethel? Turn your rocky place into a house of God. Amen. So as I pray that for me, I'm praying that for you as well. It's so good to see you. We have... Um, we visited my dad's church, my sister's church, Calvary Church, Johnson City. Got a couple other friends we want to see over the next couple of weeks. We may go away and go to Gatlinburg one weekend. Um, this has been good for our family. But I want you to know we love you. And uh, we're so grateful for you. And I want to dismiss the kids. So, um, and I get the joy of dismissing Esther to her class today. Among all the other ones. But this is the first time she's been dismissed to class in seven months. And she's doing, she's doing good. And uh, we're grateful. So all the kids stand up. Is it all the kids? Even if you're not going to class, stand up. Some of y'all stay in. You don't go to class. But stand up anyway. We want to see all the kids. All right. Look at them all. Beautiful. Beautiful. Lord, we just thank you for our children. Thank you for the blessing they are to these families and to this church. We pray, oh God, that they go to class now, that you will just help them to understand and, and receive the word of the Lord to them. Give them an encounter with you. It reveals to them who you are. And I pray for them and for me and for all of us. Oh, God, that we will know what it is to experience a Bethel as Jacob did with you. That even in the midst of our mess, we will experience the presence of God chasing us down. I thank you for that. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you give our kids a hand as they go to class today? Amen. Would you stand up together with me, please? 
11 years, almost 12 years now, I've been pastor, and God sent Kevin Holmes to me at a time when I was exhausted, and I didn't get much more rest after that, but he brought help. And I just want to honor this man and this woman, Pamela. I'm so grateful for them, for all of you, but I am so especially grateful for this man of God and the help that he has brought to me and to this church. Would you give him a hand as he comes to minister? emotional. Thanks a lot. <laughs> it is just so good to see you here today. Um, I don't know. It's just warm. It's good. Love you, Matt. Um, before we get started, um, I was talking to John Hill a few minutes ago. I messaged him because if you notice that there's kind of an empty spot where the, that family usually is. He, uh, he said that he woke up this morning and Jensen, Jensen woke up throwing up and is sick. So, um, you know, I want to take time before we get started to pray for, pray for Jensen. And uh, we're a church that believes in prayer. We're a church that believes that God hears us, that he changes things immediately. Those words that we pray enter his, his throne room and go right to him. Um, and also I want to take a moment to just praise God for a uh, for a great grandchild that was born um, this week, I think it was born on Jake's birthday. Yeah. Be Jake's uh, great, ne uh, great, nephew. great nephew. So Terry and Tammy are great <laughs> grandparents. <laughs> so just ask her how old she is later. But we want to. Uh, you know, it, it's, it was premature. It was a premature birth. Yeah. And Tuesday night, Terry was concerned and he was burdened. And, and we prayed for the health of his, of his uh, first great-grandchild. And uh, the Lord was faithful, as he always is. And, and he, you know, he, he, he made, it, made it happen, made everything go okay. Uh, continued prayer for his great-grandchild. Just a proud, uh, proud daddy, proud granddaddy, and now proud uh, great granddaddy. But we got to continue in prayer, uh, you know, because there's still complications that can come up. But let's let's, let's praise God and let's uh, but let's pray for Jensen right now. I just feel burdened to do so. So if you guys would pray with me, let's bow our heads. Lord, you are wonderful. God, we uh, Lord, we stand here. And knowing that we have a good king, Lord, we know that there is none more powerful than you, none more loving than you. No one cares like you care. No one gives out mercy and grace like you do. And Lord, we're just asking that you would heal this child of whatever is making him sick, Lord, that you would just heal his little body, comfort his parents as they take care of him, so full of life. Lord, we ask that you continue with what you're doing with Esther and her healing and, and that her body is being built back up now through this process she's been through, God, that you would, uh, that you would make her strong physically. And Lord, you are beautiful. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, if you will turn to James chapter 2 with me. So we're wearing into James chapter 2. We're going to go through the first 13 verses. As you do that, uh, say amen when you get there. Amen. We got somebody quick over here. How do we got there? Cell phone. Cell phone. I like cell phones. <laughs> uh, it's almost cheating. It's almost cheating, but it counts. 
he counts. Yeah, yeah. If you're from my generation, you have to like know how to turn one on. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's like, how do I turn this one on? Like they had cell phones that had buttons on them on the front, and that was like okay, easy. And then I got this one when I went and traded up, and they handed me a cell phone that didn't have a button on the front. I was like how how do I turn this on? There is not a button. But uh, recently, Pamela bought me a little game system. It's a little handheld thing, and it, it has like over 300 games on it, and it's this big. And it's all the games that I grew up playing, like Pac-Man and Mario Brothers. And what I love most about it, though, is the volume is not a, not. It's a dial. <laughs> the volume. You want the volume on to go down or up? You just roll the dial. And I was like, why did they change that? Like, this is the best. Like, the dials were great. Why? Why did we move past dials? But. We will, uh, we'll just move on. Okay, so we're going to go to James chapter 2, verse 1. And uh, we'll read the first 13 verses. So if you'll read with me. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel... And there should also come in a man with, in filthy clo clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, Sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, You stand there. Or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my bro beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who loved Him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture... You shall love your neighbor as yourself, and you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak, and so do, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this, uh, for this beautiful morning that you've given us with fellowship. Lord, we thank you for uh, this breakfast, this, this time that we got to gather together and just talk and hang out. Lord, we thank you for blessing us with this facility to come and, and sit down to meet together to, to worship you. Lord, I ask that you uh, help us as we break open your word today, as we try to feast. Lord, we just ask that you, uh, that you would guide our thoughts and, and, and guide our, our minds towards you this morning. Lord, I ask that you help me to teach your word. God, that you would help me to feel the full weight of responsibility what it is to, to stand here and try to, to lead in this study. Lord, I ask that you keep me humble, that I wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't be forcing out my opinions and, and trying to just entertain. Lord, I ask that you help me to, to not misrepresent you in any way. 
God, if I start to, I ask you to stop me by whatever means. Lord, we just love you. God, we praise you. We want to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so going through James again and uh, going to continue through this for a couple more weeks. Um, the letter of James, and it's important to remember when we're reading through this letter, it's a letter not written to people that don't know Jesus. This is a letter to the church. This is a letter to people that are already walking on that path following the Lord. These are people who profess to carry Jesus' name with them wherever they go. So when I was a kid, there was a, a movie. It was around like 1991. And that really doesn't feel like that long ago when I'm thinking about it. But uh, I mean, it, it's crazy, right? I talk about the year 2000 like it was yesterday. And it's, it just blows my mind when you actually count the years. Um, but when I was a kid... There was a movie called City Slickers. Has anybody ever seen that movie? It was a comedy. It's a really funny movie. And uh, the premise of the movie is real simple. I won't go into a lot of it, but it was just these guys in the business world, these friends. Uh, they had jobs and lives, and they had messed up things, or they were being successful, but just busy. And so they, decide, they, were, they decided to go out and try to capture their masculine spirit or something. And they, they end up on this range paying money for this like little vacation, these, these friends. And they end up on this range uh, wrangling cattle and stuff. And the guy that is leading them was a guy named Curly. And he's like this masculine man's man just, they didn't know, they had never seen a man like that before. And here they are hanging out with him. And, it, and instead of making them feel more masculine, rustling cattle, they feel even wimpier because they're hanging out with this, this man's man. But there's this part where... This guy Curly, the, the man's the cowboy, he just he's this old gritty man with this leathery skin and he just he looks at the the main guy, Mitch, and he says, Do you know want to know what the secret to life is? He says, you know the secret to life. And he's like, well, What is it? And he just holds his finger up. And he's like, Your finger is the secret to life? And he says, No, one thing. One thing. And he says, Well, what's that one thing? And he says, that's what you have to figure out, that one thing is. So if I was to give this, this message a title, it, it would just be Christianity 101. This, this next, these 13 verses, it's just Christianity 101. It's just one thing. You've probably heard me say it. it the number one thing that, that my faith has taught me for the 20 plus years that I've been following Jesus is that I am no better than anybody else. No matter, no matter what situation I see somebody in or what they've done, I, my faith teaches me that I'm no better than anybody else. So that's that one thing. So James 2, 1 says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Uh, I try to go into the, the languages when I, when I start out because I want to make sure that I'm not like misreading what the word is. Like sometimes you'll read a word in scripture and then you go to the original language that don't quite mean what you think it meant. But this one actually does. It's just partiality. It means to discriminate. Do not discriminate. And to discriminate just means to hold bias, or prejudice, or favoritism. And I think... That are, see, how do I want to say this? The moment that you start, that you make a decision to follow Jesus, I like to use the word follower or believer because the word Christian sometimes it, it encompasses a, a large group. We are Christians, but follower gets a little more specific. The moment that you become a believer and you step on that path you, you step on Jesus' path and you start following him you learn very quickly that the path that you're walking on is in the middle of a battlefield and there is a war going on all around you and you're walking this path 
following the Lord. And you got to be careful not to take your eyes off of Him or you might stumble. Well, when you fo start following Jesus on that path, we have an enemy who likes to attack us. And from day one, the enemy wanted to attack the church. And he did it two different ways. See, the first way is he started persecuting Christians, right? Trying to kill them, trying to imprison them, trying to discourage them physically with threats. But when that wasn't really that effective, the enemy did this other thing where he decided, you know what, I don't have to get these guys to quit coming to church. All I got to do is kind of slip in the back door, that one that they forgot to lock, and just kind of infiltrate the church. But the way he does that is by just trying to poison our hearts just a little bit. Trying to just mess us up a little bit right here in our hearts. He did that with Ananias and Sapphira in Acts, right? Goes right in. The church is just getting off the ground. And then he just kind of slips in the back door, gets these guys, and, and kind of puts a little bit of pride in their hearts. And that was the way he was going to take the church out. He hasn't stopped. He has not stopped. So, quickly, uh, and that really doesn't mean anything, because <laughs> it might not be quickly, but I want to go over three types of discrimination that the enemy uses to attack the church. In Galatians chapter 3, 26 through 29 says, this is Paul speaking. He says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor, nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. And there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. See, I've heard it said that uh, back in Jesus' time, when Jesus was walking this earth physically, that uh, Jewish men would get up in the mornings and when they would pray, they would say, uh, Thank you, God, that I was not born a Gentile. Thank you, God, that I was not born a slave. And then they would say, thank you, God, that I was not born a woman. And it's believed that when Paul was writing that statement there, that he was directly, directly confronting this prayer, that this attitude that men would pray in the mornings. So Jew nor Greek, number one. Acts 10, 28. Then he said to them, and this is Peter, said, Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to another uh, to one of another nation? But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. You see, we live uh, in a country, and not just a country but a world where the church hasn't always got it right I mean it wasn't very long ago that churches were heavily segregated uh, I was speaking to a, a man uh, this past week and, and we were talking about this He was he's a, a, a person of color and he was just kind of his thoughts on segregation he didn't even he didn't realize that there were churches that weren't segregated like, he was reading through history books and taught that all the churches were segregated. He didn't understand that there were churches in the South that had black ministers in the 1800s, that had black pastors and had white congregations. And, had, and he didn't understand that because he had never been taught that. But, you know, that was a congregation that was getting it right. But with that congregation, there was a lot of churches that got it really wrong. 
There were a lot of churches that said that black people couldn't enter the doors. Just couldn't enter the doors. They would come in and read this same Bible. And it is bizarre because I'm reading it and I'm thinking, well, did they change the words in this thing since the civil rights movement? Was there something different in here? That somehow they could read this Bible and think that that was uh, what Jesus was wanting them to do? But also, there was churches that were integrated, but you still had this thing where the white people sat up front and they had this back balconies. This was this... I mean, some of them in the 60s and 70s, like balconies back here where the black people were allowed to be in the back and the white people set up front. And it's just bizarre, but that is the history, right? So it's, it's hard to imagine today. Hard to imagine that segregation in churches happened, but all it was was the enemy attacking the church. You got to understand where the enemy comes in. He infiltrates. Sometimes we're we got our fists up, we got our guns loaded, and we're watching that front door, and we're waiting for him just to come and attack us that way. Well, that's not the way he plans to destroy the church. That's not the way he attempts it. Because often, and, and and a lot of like terrorist organizations and stuff have realized that with Christian missionaries. They don't try to kill the Christian missionaries anymore because they realize once they were killing the Christian missionaries, then the church would grow more. So the effective way that the enemy uses is he likes to try to mess our hearts up. So let's get into what our pastor has said before. Matt told me a long time ago, and then I've heard him share this from the pulpit, so I think you guys have all heard it, but he shared a story about an encounter he had that dealt with racism. But at the end of the story, he talked about how you fight racism. He said you fight racism not by posting something on social media, but by fighting it inside your own heart. And that's the way we as Christians have to deal with this type of discrimination that might pop up, is that we deal with it in our own hearts. I grew up, um, I'm Gen X, Generation X. I think it's probably the greatest generation, right? Or was it? <laughs> who's, who's, who, who else thinks Gen X is the greatest generation? <laughs> uh, but, but, um, I don't know. We'll, we'll move on <laughs> from Gen X. But Generation X grew up, right? We grew up different because, uh, for one, most houses had televisions in more than one room. And a lot of kids were babysat by the television. But when I was growing up, and this is uh, strange to say, but I was super encouraged by the masculinity of Michael Jackson. Growing up, you see, <laughs> as as a little kid, there was a video out called Thriller and Beat It, and it played on the TV. And in that video, I saw this guy who had darker skin than me, but like he's out, he's stopping. These guys are fighting with switchblades. Man, he stops the fight. He breaks it up. Zombies are coming out. He just joins them and dances. I was like, this guy, this guy's a man. You know, I was like, I want to be like. I want to be a man like Michael Jackson. That, that changed within a few years. But, but there was another guy that I looked up to. And this is no lie. When you were in elementary school my age, there were so many, so many little boys walking around with mohawks. Okay, Gen X, why did little boys cut their hair to mohawks? Mr. T. Yeah. Mr. T. Now that's one I can still stand by, is the masculinity of Mr. T. There was no one tougher, cooler, and fighting for good like Mr. T did. So I grew up thinking that, you know, I didn't have any issues with racism, because honestly, I didn't. I, I never called people by names I shouldn't call them, not in, even in secret or in secret company. That was just not an issue I had. Um, I thought 
that was all good. I, I grew up with a sister who was like a social justice warrior before there were such things. You know, like in high school, she was standing up for the underdog no matter what. That's just who she was. So I was heavily influenced by her too. And then as I got a little older, uh, the music I, that just spoke to me was this group called Run DMC. So it was rap. It was black, black guys rap. And I was like, okay. So the thought of that ever being something in me, uh, I remember going to uh, work and um, I'm working at McDonald's. At what I think I was 17 when this one happened. But you know, I'm at work and there's a, a black guy working there and somebody just come up to me and said, he pulled me into the freezer so that it wouldn't be heard because this is the way it really works in real life. Um, pulls me into the freezer so he could say something about that guy and was like, I just don't, I just don't like that. And, and he started saying that. And like, I remember feeling good about myself afterwards because I like nearly got in a fight with this man because he had said something against this other guy because he was black and he was calling him names and I stood up to him. And the guy was bigger than me, you know, and I was like, I was willing to get beat up to stand up for what I thought was right. So I thought I was standing pretty good. And I, I have more stories like that throughout life. But a few years ago, and this is after I'd been a believer for a long time, it's maybe 10 years, years ago, I'm watching TV and I turn it on and there's this boxing match. And there's nobody, and this is one of those things I feel, I don't, I don't even want to tell the story, but I have to be real with you guys. I'm watching this boxing match, and there's two guys in the ring, and I don't know either of them. I don't know what country they're from. I don't know their names. I don't, I don't even know if the fight's live. But I'm watching it, and one of them is black, and one of them is white. Right? And then the white guy knocks out the black guy in the first round. And I remember getting super excited because the white guy knocked out the black guy. And I, I mean, the Holy Spirit just crushed me so fast. And he used it to point out something to me. And he said, why were you rooting for, why were you rooting for that one? Why was I rooting for the white guy? I didn't know him. He could have been Russian for all I know. Yeah. Oh. No, I'm Gen X. We had Rocky number four. And Rocky number four, Rocky fought a Russian guy. <laughs> so this is how this works, Gen X. Um, but seriously, it was like that question. It ate at me. Why was I rooting? There's two guys in a ring and I don't know who they are. And I got excited because the white guy won and not the black guy. And there's, there's answers, right? It's natural to somebody look more like me. So I was, I guess, maybe projecting myself onto that person, maybe. But it doesn't, it doesn't make it okay. It doesn't make it okay. So I had to repent. I realized that there was something in my heart that God wasn't okay with, that if I was really following Jesus, that even those little things that are in my heart, like they can grow into bigger things. So I had to really repent and ask God to, to help me with that. And I'm not perfect with that. But I also ran into an older man, and he's uh, this guy was near 80 who just sacrificed his whole life for the Lord, him and his wife just, to, they retired so that they could serve more. And they, they, they do more now that they're retired for the Lord than they did before. They're just incredible. But he was talking to me, and I don't know why he started telling me his story. But he told me that, you know, when he got saved, him and his wife got, they, they, they got saved and became Christians as they got into adulthood, they got married. And as he was following Jesus, he hated black people. He was a follower of Jesus, that, and he said, I could not stand black people. He said, but I loved Jesus. He said when he was in his 30s, he was working as a maintenance man at several buildings, and one of them was a school. 
And one of the workers, the teachers at the school, was a black lady. He said she was a big old black lady, so he described her. Big old black lady. And he said that they had some stuff wrong at the school. He said that he got it, he fixed it for him. And as she ran up to him and was saying, Praise Jesus, and hugged him. Like, thank you, Lord. She's giving God glory. And she's just happy. And she went to hug him. And he said he stepped back and yelled at her and said, Don't you ever touch me with disgust. And he said that she said, you may hate me, but Jesus loves you, so I love you. And he said it just wrecked him. He said he had to go back later. He repented. God healed him of it. He said he doesn't feel it at all now. Like I said, he was reading the same Bible that we read, and somehow the enemy had penetrated his heart, like infiltrated his heart with, with this stuff. And it was strange. So we must examine ourselves and examine our hearts. Number two, slave nor free. James 2, 2 through 4. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man with filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, Sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, stand there, or sit here at my footstool. You have not shown, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? See, I have an uncle uh, who passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and he, he had, I think COVID was finally what took him out, but he suffered from Parkinson's for a long time. But he pastored a church about this size in Richlands, Virginia, he did it for years. And he loved his congregation, and his congregation loved him. I mean, he, he just loved them so much. And he was a guy who taught the Word. And, and he preached to love your neighbor. I mean, he was just ahead of his time as, as a minister, and rare for that area at that time. When it come to uh, having... Re he would have these revival meetings at least twice a year, week long, where he would do this, but he would invite black ministers and, and pay these black ministers to come in, uh, male and female, to come and, and work these revivals and preach them. And he just had that heart. Well, he read this story. I think it, it's, I've read it online, you know, on Facebook. It's popped up a few times, but I think back then he'd read it in a book, but it was about a pastor who had dressed up like a homeless man and then laid in front of his church. Have you guys heard this? this story ever. It's this pastor had dressed up to test out his congregation to see how they would react if anybody would show love to the homeless person. So the pastor had dressed up. He laid down in front of the church to see if any of his congregations would stop to help him. Uh, they did the opposite of help. They were mad that they were there. They didn't try to give him a hand up, invite him into church or see what was wrong. They were just stepping over him, walking by him, insulting him, and trying to see if they could get the police or somebody to come remove him. Uh, so he read this, and he had a conversation. He thought to himself in his heart, not my church. You know, it stinks for that pastor that his church was bad, but my church would never do that. Well, he had a, a guy that was going to his church, and they had this conversation. We're talking about it, and the guy was like, I don't think that you know your church as well as you think you do. So they got a bet, and my uncle bet this man that his church would invite the, the homeless person in. So the pastor didn't dress up, but that man dressed up, blacked his face out with dirt, and really looked rough. Really looked rough. And uh, just unrecognizable. And they have a little sign out by the sidewalk, and the front door is right off the sidewalk. He propped himself down. I think he'd even got like a bottle of alcohol. And like he really played the part. And he laid down on there. And my pastor kind of went in and was just waiting, waiting to see what his church would do. And to his surprise, <laughs> and nobody's surprised in this room, they, uh, they came in complaining about the guy laying out there. They were not concerned about him in any way. They were just upset that he was there and they just disgusted with this guy. 
So it really opened his eyes. What he ended up doing, though, and, and my cousin pastors that church now, not his son, uh, but my cousin who was related to him. He pastors that church now, and they carry this tradition on. Now, what he did was he started going out and getting the people that were home, actually homeless in Richlands and bringing them to his church. He had a little van, and they would get the homeless people to go, and the people that you know, were super poor in that area, practically homeless, he started bringing them in. And when people would tell him and complain about how those people smelled, he would let them know where the door was because he was going to do the work of the Lord. So my cousin, carrying that tradition on, Thanksgiving, he doesn't worry about where he's traveling because he goes to the church and he cooks. Thanksgiving dinner at the church and opens the doors for anybody who needs to come. But you see, we live uh, we live in a country where there's not really the haves and the have-nots. We live in a country where it's the haves and the have-mores. And sometimes we can forget that because we, we start seeing things. Everybody here has a full stomach this morning. If you don't, it's, it's your own fault. <laughs> but we live in a country where homeless people get more than enough calories that they need. They're homeless, but they can go to trash cans and get enough calories to sustain life. There's other countries where that's not possible. Sometimes it's not uh, looking at rich people and lifting them up. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> it's adorable. You love it when cute things happen at church. This week's that's sweet. But anyway, sometimes it's not that we're uh, discriminating against rich people. I mean, that we're not like lifting. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's distracted. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, it's funny. But anyway, so. Sometimes in this country, especially in the current climate, a rich person comes into the room and the majority of the people aren't trying to lift them up. They're kind, kind of trying to demonize somebody who's successful these days. And I remember when I was 18, I, I lived in Winston-Salem. I was renting a room off somebody and I thought, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get started in life. And I started working hard. But I was also listening to a lot of punk rock music and stuff, and, and, and a lot of it was communist. I didn't even know what communism really was, but a lot of that music was communist, and it was influencing me, and I didn't realize it in, in that way of to, to not like somebody who's successful, like to think that, that they got there by stepping on people or something. And I remember working, and, and I was driving a small old car, and I'd worked all night, got off work at 7. I'm driving through Winston-Salem to go home, and I'm in the city. And all of a sudden, my car just stops working. Right? And this is about 7.30-ish, 8 o'clock, and the traffic is crazy. So I'm like, you know, this is awful. I'm weighing about 140 pounds. I'm going to have to get out and push this car. And then I, when I get out to push it, I realize that, that I'm in the city. The curbs are up. I can't just push it off the side of the road. I'm going to have to push this car like hundreds of feet to, this, to where I can get it off the road. So I get out, and I'm trying to push it. And if you've ever done that by yourself, and you're holding the door open, you're holding the steering wheel, and you're trying to push the car at the same time, I start to move it, and then immediately it starts to rain. Like it just starts to rain, and I'm like, I just, I'm just so mad. And I'm like, I'm not a Christian, by the way. So, and I'm like, I am so mad about this. And as it's starting to rain, I was like, this is terrible. And then my foot slips, <laughs> and I bang my knee on the pavement. So now my knee hurts. It's raining. I'm pushing this car, and I, I'm, I'm just furious. But then I'm thinking, okay. And then all these people start beeping their horn at me behind me. I'm looking back, and these are all the working class, right? It's supposed to be my allies, the working class guys, driving cars older than mine, some of them. And they're, instead of getting out and helping me, they're beeping their horns at me. And I'm just like, this is awful. And uh, 
as this happens and I'm trying to push this car and I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get it moving again, I'm getting soaked. This person pulls up and, and what I, in my memory, I'm thinking was a Ferrari. And he, he looked, he had his trophy wife with him, beside of him, right? And he gets out in his suit. He has slick shoes on. I mean, it's 7.30 in the morning. This guy is a high roller. He stops his car while everybody else is beeping. This, what I perceive to be a very wealthy man, jumps out of his car, runs over, and he's like, do you need help? Let me help you. And he starts, he wasn't, I wasn't even blocking him. And he starts pushing that car with me. And I, I looked awful, you know, by, at that time. I was, I looked almost like a skinhead Nazi. But, I mean, I, I did. I looked rough. Like, I, I had brass knuckle belt buckles, a wife beater on, tattoos showing, head shaved. I think I may have had a mohawk, but I can't remember. But we're pushing this car. And he pushes it all the way to the end with me, pushes it out. And then he pulls out this big thing, which I found out was a cell phone. This guy actually had a cell phone back then. It was big. And he was like, hey, let's call somebody to help. Who, who can we call? What, what do you need? And, and he waited until my help showed up to, to, to pick me up. He waited there. Right. And I didn't even know the Lord, but I could feel that I was learning a lesson. I could feel that I was learning a lesson. So it's been said... That a rich man without God is just a poor man with money. So we live in a country, a world, where 70% of the world lives on less than $10 a day. 70% of the world. Now, I've done math and this ain't going to be accurate, but if 70% of the world is living on less than $10 a day, it means that they're eat, most of them are just lucky to get one meal. One meal. And if you do the break down the math more, that's about 425 million Christians. So that's our brothers and sisters, right? These are the same people that are following Jesus, that we're connected to in our faith. About 425 million of them are living in actual real poverty. Not what we might perceive as Americans that, you know, they cut my cable off so I'm broke. I'm, I must be poor. But it's, these are people that can't eat. Now, these are our brothers and sisters, so we've got to remember to be grateful. To remember we are the wealthy ones that need to be helping. So number three, male nor female. And this one will not be controversial at all. No, nobody will get offended at me, I promise. That's the way this works. Just by reading Scripture... Genesis 127 says, So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 127. 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15. I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath, doubting, in like so manner that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. I don't understand. What? <laughs> <laughs> Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. <laughs> For Adam was, first, was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So, when somebody says, women, where would we be without them? 
the answer is still in the Garden of Eden. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just teasing. <laughs> we, we, we know the truth. It says by one man we fell, not one woman. By the sin of one man, Adam. But it does say some things in here that have caused division uh, amongst churches. Like you have groups of churches. It says things like women are to be silent. That women are not to teach. That women are to, uh, to not hold authority over a man. Has anybody else ever read this and been a little bit confused and, and wondering? Because I was not raised in church. And all I wanted to know was what the truth was. So at 20 years old when I started reading the Bible, I was going to a Pentecostal church. And we had women that got up and preached. But then I'm reading the Bible for myself and I'm trying to figure out how does this work? Because these are godly women who love the Lord and would never do anything to try to... If, if God told them not to preach, they would not be preaching. So I was like, well, what's going on? And it, at current climates, you have two things that are two words, egalitarianism and complementarianism. Has anybody ever heard these words? Okay, and I'm not going to do a thorough teaching on this, but egalitarianism is... Uh, that men and women uh, are completely equal, that there is no difference in any area, and that, that applies to church, that Christ has made no, no male nor female. He makes no difference. So when you get in churches uh, and, and in, in the congregations and in life, that women hold equal status in every way, right? And then complementarianism uh, says that we are equal completely in value, but that they hold different gender roles, right? So, you know, just like as the man and the woman are at home, they hold, they're different. They recognize the difference of, between men and women, the strengths and the weaknesses. And we hold different roles, both equally value, but different roles. And then they apply that to the church too and say, same thing. Women and men are different. They have different gender roles in the church so that they believe that women uh, should not be pastors or hold authority over men because the man should be the head of the house so that the, uh, a man should be the head of the church. And, and it gets into this debate. And when you're listening to the debates, it's like, well, you listen to one, you're like, man, that makes perfect sense. And then I'll listen to another one, and I'll say, well, no, that one makes perfect sense. And I think that as a church, we try to put ourselves in boxes that we shouldn't, right? We're not, we're not commanded by Christ to be in a box with a label on it there's things about complementarianism that is 100% true. And then there's things about egalitarianism that is 100% true. So I don't allow myself to be placed in a box with labels. If you do dig into the text, one of the arguments for egalitarianism, or one of the arguments, is that Paul's writing in a specific letter to Timothy. Paul wrote a lot of letters. This is one letter where he is seriously addressing an issue that's going on uh, in this this church that Timothy was uh, pastoring you had a lot of females that had came out of this mysticism and holding um, positions in society that they were at as leaders and stuff so when they came into the church Paul had set leaders up in the church and one of them being Timothy and these people with high status these ladies just because they were transitioning. They were new believers, but they were coming in and they were trying to just kind of run it and overrule. And historically, that's what was going on. And, and when Paul addresses this, and we know that that historically was what was going on, then it makes a little more sense when you go into the backgrounds. But I don't know. I think I just have to, to be delicate and to love my sisters and my brothers both. Recognize the gifts that God's given people. I like to think of it like a, a plane crash scenario. If, if I'm on the plane and we're all on this plane and, the, and all of a sudden the pilot and the co-pilot, for whatever reason, maybe it's like that old movie and, and they've eaten some bad food and they got poisoned and they're just out, they're dead. 
And then we run back to the plane and we're like, is there anybody here able to fly a plane? If a woman stands up and all the men are like, I don't know how to fly a plane. But a woman stands up and she's like, yeah, my dad taught me to fly a plane when I was a kid. I've done it my whole life. Are we going to tell her that we don't believe in women flying? <laughs> in that scenario, do we say that? Because she's the only one in that situation. So it can be situational. There's times where God has used a female judge and he said because there was no men able to do it at that time. No men were, were stepping up. We're different in this church. We have a ton of men who bring their families to church, who teach their children the word of God, who lead their houses in prayer. If you visited other churches, that's not the way most churches are. Most churches, you have men that refuse to even go. So, like I said, nothing controversial. <laughs> nothing controversial. Just something to think about. If you're in a situation where there's not a man, I do this thing where I'll ask people to close in prayer. I'll ask people to close in prayer. We'll have men and women. And I'm like, let's close out in prayer. And this is not to beat up on anybody. I've been there. But all the men, the majority of the time, sit there like, do not ask me to close in prayer. Most of the time, as we sit there awkwardly because I, they realize that I'm not going to close in prayer, I'm waiting on a man to step up and lead, a woman usually will raise her hand and, and close out in prayer. So am I supposed to tell her that she can't? When all the men have had the opportunity to do it. I don't know. Just something to think about. Something to pray about. I had a friend who who was a Baptist and he thought that Baptists were the only people that went to heaven. So he would go to prisons and he had this access to go in and preach to prisoners. But so he went to the church one day and as he's preaching to the prisoners he goes up to the little pulpit they had for him and a Methodist pastor had been there and he had his Methodist Bible and he picked up the Methodist Bible and said if you guys keep listening to this you're all going to hell and he threw the Bible and he hit the wall and he was bragging about it because it's like you know, only Baptists can do this, you know. I guess when a Methodist tells somebody about Jesus, it doesn't count. So anyway, in conclusion, James, uh, James 2, verse 10 says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. As, a, as you grow in your faith, you kind of realize a little bit, you know, you get deeper, you get closer to Jesus. It's the thing where you get into the light, right? You pull the curtains. Remember growing up and you'd pull curtains and the light would come in and you would see dust floating in the air. But you didn't see the dust until you pulled the curtains open. As we As we go further, like we may... We're like, you know, I need Jesus. But the closer you get to Him, the more you realize just how much you really did need Him. It's kind of like hanging by a chain. Let's say you're hanging by a chain of ten links. And you're just hanging maybe over a bottomless pit or some alligators down there trying to snap at your feet. You're hanging by this chain. How many links of the chain have to break before you fall? It's one link, right? And that's what he's saying is that 
if you've broken one, then you're guilty of breaking it all. And sometimes we can look at at different people and we think that we make the mistake of thinking we're better than them. We'll see them down and out, passed out in a ditch, right? <laughs> passed out in a ditch. Or maybe they've cheated on their wife, ruined their family. Maybe a woman's abandoned her kids. We can look at her. We can look at them and we can just have disgust. We can think, man, we're better. But really what we're saying is that they're worse than us because they broke more links in the chain. But we're both laying in that same pit. We both fail. There's a, there's a story, and it goes off Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's kind of like a Gilligan's Island scenario. You know, you have these guys out in the ship, and they go way out in the ocean, and then the ship starts to sink. So on this boat, you have, you have teenagers, you have elderly, you have male, you have female, you have black people, you have white people. They're all on this ship, and they're out in the ocean, and it starts sinking. And they have no choice but to go into the water, and then they just, they know shore is that way, they can't see it, but they know that the shoreline is somewhere that way, so they all just start swimming. And slowly, one by one, though, you know, you have the, the elderly. They make it a little ways, and then they just go under. Then you have people my age, right? And, and they're swimming, maybe. Maybe people in good shape, they make it a couple miles. Then they go under. Then you got like these teenagers, you know, maybe they were on the swim team. Maybe they're good swimmers. They make it like... 15 miles and they go under and it, it's like they all set out swimming but in the end they all fell short of reaching the shore and you see that's the equalizer as Christ he, he equalizes all of us we're all the same there's no male, there's no female, there's no black or white there's no rich or poor because when it comes to the law of God it is the great equalizer we are all in that pit but that's what makes Jesus so great is that he comes and, and just loves us all equally we're all in that muddy pit together and he doesn't see any difference in us so with that being said, the worship team can come on up. I'm going to pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day, God. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you love us. God, we thank you that you, uh, that you tolerate us, Lord. <laughs> that you dish out mercy. God, that you give us grace. That you can see us in our arrogance. You can see us. You can see us when we get it wrong and, and you don't beat us up. But God, we thank you for your correction. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now as the worship team plays and they start singing songs, if anybody needs prayer, come on up to the altar. I know you guys. I know, I know you guys. Don't be afraid to come up to the altar and pray. We all have things that we need to pray about. We all have people we need to pray for. If you really believe God can change hearts, change lives, heal people, then come to the altar. In front of everybody. We're all equal. Just come up and reach out to the Lord. Love you guys. You know, something that Kevin spoke on was being prejudiced. And 
I was raised in, um, my dad was in the military, so we lived on military bases. And we lived in Louisiana for about seven years. That's where I started school was in Louisiana. And you know, I didn't realize until we moved back to this area, back to Tennessee, gray area, just how, were, how I was raised different. I didn't see black or white, didn't look at anything that was different. You know, it didn't make any difference to me. I, I just knew that they were children of God. And it's hard when you come back and you, you hear people say things about, well, their skin's darker than mine or this and that, you know. No, we're all the same. We're all the same. And um, so it really struck a, a chord that, you know, we have to love people no matter what the color, no matter what language they speak, no matter where they're from. It, he doesn't say in his word that we love based on what color you are or what language you speak or what country you're from, whatever. He just says, love your neighbor and love one another. That's all he says. So I had to share that because it's very important. I've never been a prejudiced person, and and sometimes it bothers me when I hear people make comments that are not so so loving. And God is love. He's not judgment. He's love. So.
remember about when I first started coming to church is uh, the person that I was and where I had come from and all the bad things that I had done, whether you guys knew it or not, I knew it in my heart. And uh, the way that I was treated here, uh, despite that, and then when I started to open up about some of the things that I had done and been through and the choices that I made, uh, the encouragement, the love, uh, not being judged, but just being felt, felt like I was loved. Um, that's one of the reasons that I love that I can call this my home church. So it's something that I appreciate. So let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. Uh, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with today, Lord, uh, for the ability to get up and come and worship you, Lord, and to hear your word. We thank you for the meal. We ask that you bless the hands that provided it as well as prepared it, Lord. We thank you for, for Jamie and his song today, Lord. I, I believe that it blessed a lot of us, Lord. We thank you for him. We ask that you go with him this week, Lord. We thank you for Kevin and his message, Lord. And we just ask that, that no matter what we face this week, Lord, that we revert back to that, Lord. If we were put in a situation, we, we pray that we have the correct words, Lord, and, and the correct actions that ultimately just bring someone closer to you, Lord. We thank you for Pastor Matthew and his family being here today, Lord. Uh, even though that we miss them, we understand that they need this time, Lord, and we just ask that you be with them during this time and, and bless them, Lord, and give them the, the needed rest that they need, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done, Lord, and we just ask that you please help us not only to be hearers of the word and, and readers of the word, but most importantly, doers of the word, God. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask this. Amen. I'm 